We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now. Because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Those were the final words of the final speech delivered by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The following day, he would be assassinated on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. Did he know that with those words he was giving his farewell address? Did he have a feeling or or a premonition of some kind deep down, or did he just know of the ongoing threats of danger and violence that faced him every day as he carried out the mission of God? By this point, Dr. King had already survived a stabbing, a shooting, even a bombing attempt. So is that what he meant when he said, we've got some difficult days ahead? Did he mean more persecution is coming, more strife? With foreshadowing statements like, I would like to live a long life, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And statements like, I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. With statements like those, his tone on this night seemed more like that of a final goodbye. Multiple witnesses said that King had tears in his eyes as he took his seat that night. Among those witnesses was one of his good friends, the Reverend James Jordan. And James said that on this night, it was as though King was just saying, goodbye, I hate to leave. You see, Reverend Jordan had had a dire premonition just six days earlier. He had a terrible nightmare that woke him up in tears. Reverend Jordan said that Dr. King's picture came before him and he saw that the Lord had shown him Dr. King's death. In the end, the Reverend Dr. Martin King, Martin Luther King Jr.'s final speech would famously become his farewell address. And he used his final words to encourage his listeners. He said, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. He's saying, with or without me, you can do this. You all can do this. You are equipped to do this work and carry on the mission of God. And you will get to the promised land. Just keep going keep going. Dr. King was effectively passing the baton that night, saying, keep going, keep going. And in just a moment, we'll be taking a look back at another farewell address, another passing of the baton, the Apostle Paul's farewell speech to the leaders of the church of Ephesus. And like that of Dr. King, Paul's somber farewell is equally ominous and foreshadowing in its tone, but it's also full of encouragement. It's full of encouragement. It's Paul's way of saying, you can do this. You are equipped to carry on the mission of God. So grab the baton and keep going. Keep going. So if you have a Bible with you, turn to Acts chapter 20 in the House Bibles. That's page 925. 
And while you're turning there to Acts chapter 20, let me say welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Some of you are watching right now. Good morning, thank you for being here. And some of you, even from around the world, will watch this later on in the week. So wherever you find yourself, you are welcome and thank you for being part, a vital part of this church family. And of course, thank you to all of you who showed up in person today. It is good to see your faces. It's good to hear you worship. It's even good to hear some of your crying babies. It's just good to be together. So thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here and for worshiping together with us. And last night, we said another kind of farewell. We said a farewell to our Fishers campus, who as of this morning officially are no longer a campus of grace, but rather they are their own independent church plant, and we are celebrating, celebrating with them. We wanted you to hear a couple words uh, from Pastor Kevin Roth. Um, he spoke with us last night, and as I said, they're launching this morning, so take a look at what he had to say to us last night. Obviously, I'm a little bit of a tweet. You know, like Paul was saying goodbye, there's a part of me that it just feels hard to say goodbye. I've been on staff for 22 years. I've had some incredible friendships. Even walking in here tonight, I see familiar faces. I see friends that I haven't seen in a long time. And so it's a little bit like when you send your kids off to college, uh, there's a part of you that is sad. There's also, when you're heading off to college, there's a part of you that's excited for new experiences and new possibilities. And uh, so we're excited about the things that God is doing in Fishers. We believe that he has planted us there at 126 in Olio uh, for a very specific reason. We're within walking distance of four schools and 5,000 students. And we believe that God has placed us there to help bring justice for kids, both inside the walls of Grace Fishers, as well as the kids in the community. And we want to reach beyond that to bring justice for kids in other ways. But we're also really passionate. Marin uh, couldn't have been a better message uh, to send us off with. We are passionate about every person uh, hearing the good news and becoming fully who God has called them to be. Uh, the most unique thing, though, or the, the, I'd say the surprise in getting launched into Fishers, though, is the way that because we are planted in a singular community, the way that we can be for the community, we have had opportunities to come alongside the city uh, with mental health and other activities, and so we're just thankful to be able to be planted there, um, and it is exciting. And I just want to say one last thing, and it's two simple words, and it's the words, thank you. We wouldn't be launching tomorrow without Grace Church, uh, without the leadership of Grace, believing in the vision of continuing to multiply God's kingdom, even in the process that we went through saying, okay, yeah, we're going to invest in launching you guys out. And I just appreciate the opportunity to come back here and to say thank you to all of you. And I hope tomorrow as we launch, you guys feel as much pride and as excitement as we do as we get launched. So thank you, thanks for having us back, and thank you for commissioning us tonight. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Amen, we're celebrating with Grace Fishers this morning what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will continue to do, amen. And today we also say farewell to our summer series. Nine weeks we've been in the, in the series we are calling How It Started and How It's Going. All summer long we've been taking a look back at the early church through the book of Acts, the how it started part, and we've been taking a look at the church of today, the, the how it's going part. We kicked off the summer with a look at the birth of the church. It was a community that was filled with awe and wonder, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a church that was growing daily and the gospel of Jesus was beginning to spread. But not everyone was welcoming of this new church movement. Some saw these new Christ followers as a threat to their way of life and they would stop at nothing to stop the spread of this gospel of Jesus, even if it meant persecuting these new Christians to the point of death. But despite intense persecution, the gospel continued to spread. It spread to a man named Saul of Tarsus, who after himself persecuting the church to the point of death, 
had his own dramatic life-changing encounter with the voice of the risen Jesus. His life would be forever changed. And from that moment on, he'd be known as the Apostle Paul. And God would use Paul to bring the good news of the gospel further into the heart of the Gentile world, that is the non-Jewish world, proving that the gospel of Jesus is for everyone, for everyone who would listen and believe. That meant that the gospel was now spreading to those outside of the Jewish world. It was spreading to the nations. For the first time, the gospel of Jesus was heard in Europe and it began to spread there. It seemed that nothing, not imprisonment or beatings or riots or threats of violence, nothing could stop the good news from spreading. The light of the gospel was piercing the darkness, but the darkness would not go quietly without a fight. And that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 20. This passage comes right after the massive riot in Ephesus. In case you missed it, uh, last week Barry told us about what happened in Ephesus when the gospel of Jesus began to pierce through the darkness there and challenge the spiritual dynamics of that city. When some of the idol-worshiping locals perceived that their livelihood, their way of life was being threatened, they pushed back. They started a riot. And as their anger boiled over, the whole city was thrown into chaos and confusion. The riot was so intense that the mayor of Ephesus had to come and calm everybody down before they all got in trouble. And that is where Acts 20 picks up. This massive riot had just ended. And Paul is summoning the local believers to himself to encourage them one more time before he leaves Ephesus to embark on the final leg of his missionary journey. And so he traveled for a few months down to Greece, up and around, and he eventually ended up in a town called Miletos. And in order to get there, he and his missionary partners had to sail right on past the town of Ephesus. But Luke tells us that Paul decided not to stop there this time. And we don't exactly know why that is, but have you ever been driving somewhere and you have to pass a town, or or in my case, a few towns, where you'd love to stop and say hello to some of your friends and family, but for the sake of time, you just don't have time to meet with everyone individually, so you have to keep going. That happens to me every time I go home to Chicago to visit family. I go right past the region, northwest Indiana, and I want to stop and say hi to all my friends, but in the interest of time, you know, got to keep it moving. And that might have been what was happening with Paul. After all, he was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem in time for the festival of Pentecost, and he didn't have time to stop and meet with everyone in Ephesus individually. So maybe that's why he passed them by. Or maybe it's because the last time he was in Ephesus, a huge riot broke out. He knew that had he stopped in Ephesus, there was a good chance that he would be recognized immediately and that more trouble could have broken out. Trouble that would have impacted both him and the people he was traveling with. Trouble that could have prevented him from ever getting to Ephesus. I'm sorry, to Jerusalem. So for whatever reason, Paul decides to sail past Ephesus, but he does want to meet with his Ephesian church leader friends one more time before he sails to Jerusalem. So he had a plan. Get all of his friends together and talk to them all at once in one spot, right? Efficiency. But also to gather them outside of Ephesus where it would likely be much safer for them to gather. So when he landed in the town of Miletos, He sent a message to the elders of the Ephesian church asking them to come and meet him. And when these elders arrive, Paul delivers a passionate and heartfelt farewell address. This is the one record we have in Acts where Paul is speaking directly to people who are already Christians. Elsewhere in the Bible, we see him preaching to large groups of Gentiles or large groups of Jews, but this is the only time we see this in the book of Acts where Paul is speaking directly to the church, directly to church leaders. Paul had served the church of Ephesus faithfully for nearly three years, and now it's goodbye. It's time to pass the baton. 
So read with me down in Acts chapter 20, verse 18. It says, when they arrived, he declared, you know that from the day I set foot on the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I've endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus. So Paul opens his famous farewell address with a reminder of the example that he had lived out before them. For nearly three years, Paul modeled for these leaders how to be humble, how to endure hardship, and how to share the good news of the resurrection of Jesus with everyone, absolutely everyone who would listen, Jews and non-Jews alike. For three years, he equipped them by his example of life, He showed them how to live as a servant shepherd. He showed them how to live as Jesus lived. And now he's passing the baton. He's saying, I showed you how to do this. And now it's your turn. You can do this. You are equipped to carry on the mission of God. My dear Ephesian friends, take and keep going. Keep going. He continues in verse 22. And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem, and I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Okay, I want to stop there because at first glance, that could seem harsh coming from Paul. He's saying if anyone suffers eternal death, It's not my fault. Is that that how he means it? Like, don't look at me. I showed you the path to eternal life. Eternal death, that's on you. Is he copying an attitude here? Is that what he's doing? No, I I don't think that he's being dismissive, and I don't think that he's giving himself a pat on the back. I think what he is saying, essentially, is that I've put it all out there. I've put it out there before you. I held nothing back from you. I told you everything that God wants you to know, and now you know it. You are equipped. In Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, he describes the role of leaders in the church. Every church leader has the responsibility of equipping the people of God to do the work of the ministry. And so with these words, Paul is effectively passing the baton. He's saying, I've done my job. I've equipped you. My leg of the race is over, and now it's your turn. You are equipped. You can do this. You are equipped to carry on the mission of God. So keep going. Keep going. In a final admonition, down in verse 28, he says, so guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. Guard yourselves and guard God's people. Feed and shepherd them and never forget that you are equipped because you've been appointed by the Holy Spirit. Paul is reminding these elders of the gravity and the nobleness of their calling. They shepherd the church, God's flock. The church belongs to God. It doesn't belong to these elders. It never could because they could never afford the price that Christ paid when he purchased back his flock with his own blood. The good shepherd laid down his very life for the sheep. The church is that precious to God. 
It cost him everything. And these elders from Ephesus and subsequently every other church leader appointed by the Holy Spirit down through history has been given the charge of shepherding, that is, protecting and nurturing and feeding God's flock, his precious church bought by his own blood. And with the final admonition from Paul comes a warning. In verse 29, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. So watch out. Remember the three years that I was with you. My constant watch and care over you day and night and my many tears for you. It's hard to say farewell. It's hard to say goodbye to something that you love. It's hard to let go. And Paul loved the Ephesian church to tears. He said, I've shed many tears for you. He speaks like a loving shepherd here, warning them about the danger of false teachers. Vicious wolves, he calls those false teachers. He says they'll take the truth of the gospel and distort it just to gain a following. Again, in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul warns that these false teachers would try to trick them with lies so clever they sounded like truth. But watch out because they're wolves. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. So stay vigilant. Keep watch over the flock. He says, remember how I watched over you the same way that a shepherd lives among his sheep and watches over them day and night. That is how vigilant you must be in caring for God's people. And I won't sugarcoat it for you. This is not going to be easy. At times, caring for God's people will break your heart. And I've shed many tears for you. But now, now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I've never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes, and you know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and the needs of those who were with me. I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried They embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad, most of all, because he had said that they would never see him again. Then they escorted him down to the ship. This marks the beginning of the end for Paul. With these words, Paul brings to a close his missionary work as a free man. And for our purposes today, our story ends here, but this is by no means where the story ends for Paul. Because some of y'all already know there are eight more chapters left in the book of Acts. And those chapters are full of adventure. After Paul says goodbye to the Ephesian elders, he hits a few more stops on his way down to Jerusalem. And all along the way, his friends are telling him, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go. They knew that his life would be in grave danger. One of his friends even had a dire premonition. He prophesied that Paul would be bound with chains and imprisoned by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem before being turned over to the Gentiles. But Paul reassured his friends that not only was he ready to be jailed for the sake of the Lord Jesus, but he was even prepared to die. Like Dr. King, I am sure that Paul desired to live a long life. Longevity has its place but he was not concerned about that now. He only wanted to do God's will. And so he gets to Jerusalem, and guess what happens there? An angry mob, another riot, and the dire prophecy comes true. Paul is arrested by the Jewish leaders, and he does get turned over to the Gentiles. He gets shipped off to Rome, 
to stand trial before Caesar, but on his way to Rome, he gets shipwrecked. Some of you know the story. He gets shipwrecked. And while he is shipwrecked on the island, shipwrecked, he gets bitten in the hand by a poisonous snake. I'm telling you, the last eight chapters in the book of Acts, they read like a screenplay from an action movie. You've got to read it. Don't let the series end here. Read those chapters or do what I do. Let your phone read it out loud to you while you're cooking dinner or something. They're full of action. He does get to Jerusalem, and Luke's point in recording all of this drama from Jerusalem to the island of Malta up to Rome, his point in recording all of this drama here at the end of Acts is to emphasize the fact that through it all, no matter the circumstances, the gospel continues to spread. It can't be stopped. Because of that awful shipwreck, the islanders heard the good news of Jesus. And the gospel spread there. Eventually, Paul does reach Rome where he's placed under house arrest. But that hardly matters because Luke tells us that Paul had visitors and he boldly shared the gospel of Jesus with everyone who came to visit him while he was incarcerated. And guess what else he did? He wrote letters. Letters that we still have today. Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. That's how it started and that's how it's going. Because through these letters, Paul continues to encourage us as a church today. His voice echoes down through the ages and encourages us now, just as it did the early church. That's how it started, and that is how it's going. And we don't know the exact circumstances of how Paul was martyred. We do know that as a Roman citizen, he would have been spared the um, crucifixion. He probably died by beheading. We don't know exactly the time or the date, but what we do know is that from then until now, nothing has been able to stop the advancement of the gospel of Jesus because good news spreads like wildfire. It still does. That's how it started and that's how it's going. And we know that the gospel of Jesus will continue to spread, only now it spreads through us. In Paul's farewell address, he wanted us to know that we, church, can do this. We are equipped to carry on the mission of God, so grab the baton and keep going. Spread the good news, equip others, carry on the mission of God, and keep going. At the end of his second letter to Timothy, Paul says you must remain faithful to the things you've been taught All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and it teaches us to do right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. God uses scripture to teach us to do right, to correct us where we've gone wrong, and yes, to equip us to carry on his mission. That's how it started, and that's how it's going. At Grace Church, we will continue to deepen our understanding of scripture together as we search the word and humbly pursue his truth together. This is how we equip ourselves. This is how we equip each other. We utilize what God has already given us, his word, his Holy Spirit, who Jesus promised would help lead us and guide us to all truth. This is how God strengthens and prepares us for the work ahead. We can do this. We are equipped to carry on the mission of God. So grab the baton and keep going. The church is alive and she is still precious to God. And that's great news because you are the church and you are precious to God. You are how it's going. So guard yourselves and guard each other. Protect yourselves and protect each other because there are wolves out there. Don't, don't try to go it alone. That was true for the early church and it's true for us today. These wolves threaten not only to destroy the individual, but they want to scatter the entire flock and drive the whole thing into chaos. Don't try to go it alone. Let me echo what Dave and Barry said a few weeks ago. We hear the voice of God, the good shepherd, most clearly when we discern it together in community. 
My friends, don't, don't you dare go it alone. We need each other. Feed each other, nurture each other, and listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit together. Because here's what I believe. What I believe for the church and what I believe for Grace Church, I believe that God is calling us to be family. And I know how cliche that can sound, so don't tune me out just yet. Because what I mean when I say that God is calling us to be family, I see a picture in my mind that looks like this. I see him gathering. I see him gathering all of his people to himself. And it's already happening here at Grace Church. It's already happening. He's gathering people of different cultural backgrounds and different socioeconomic backgrounds. He's gathering people of all ages, from children to students to parents to grandparents. He's taking the lonely and he's placing them in families. We saw it even within this series a few weeks ago when we did baptisms. And young and old alike went under the waters of baptism and came up in declaration of their faith in Jesus. We saw it over here at the cross that same day as individuals and entire families lit candles as a symbolic gesture of their rededication to following Christ. And yesterday morning I saw it at our community fair as grandparents served the community hand in hand with their grandchildren. Who, who here volunteered yesterday at the community fair? Raise your hands high, because I love y'all. We saw it. We saw the family of God coming together. He's making us a family. And as I watched all those things taking place, I keep hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, it's happening. It's happening. I am here. I am with you. So keep going. Young and old, and those of us somewhere in between, He's making us a family. He's unifying us by his love. Now, I like this image. It reminds me of a song my grandma used to sing, Bringing in the Sheaves. Every, every stalk of wheat is laying neatly in order and in a tight, tidy little bundle. It's, it's perfect, but it's a little too perfect because in my mind, the image of God gathering his children unto himself and unifying us with his love looks a little more like this. It, it's wild. It's gritty and raw and untamed. It isn't an oil painting of some idealistic scene. It's a picture of real life. Some stalks are bent and some are broken and some may be prickly, and unruly, they're definitely not all uniform. None of those stalks are the same because this isn't about sameness. And none of those stalks are perfect because this isn't about perfection. But in our wild imperfection, God bends down, God comes near and gathers all his broken children into his arms like a big fatherly bear hug. And all we have to do gathered safe in his arms, all we have to do is remain in his love, safe from the wolves, never alone. Remain, remain, remain in his love. And in his love, we can do this. We are equipped by Christ's unifying love to carry on the mission of God, so keep going, but go together. Keep going together. So let's get practical. Is this a message to church leaders? Well, yes, it is. Paul was speaking to the elders of the Ephesian church in his farewell speech. He was telling them, you're the shepherds now. You watched how I cared for you. Now go and care for God's people in the same way. And he passed the baton. So where does that leave the rest of us? Those of us that aren't necessarily elders or, or leaders in the church, where does it leave our congregation? Well, Paul tells us in his letter to that same Ephesian church that it was the job of those elders that he said goodbye to, it was their job to equip the people of God to do the work of the ministry. So guess what you get to do? <laughs> Who does the work of the ministry? You do, God's people, you do. 
the family of God. And yes, God will appoint elders. He will appoint pastors and teachers and shepherds to guide you. But it's so that you can go and carry on the mission of God and do the work of the kingdom. That's how it started. And that's how it's going. The baton has been passed from Paul down to the leaders of the early church, down through the ages to the leaders of the church today, to you, to you. You can do this. You are equipped to carry on the mission of God. So grab the baton and keep going. Keep going. And what does that look like? How do we do this practically? Okay, I'm fired up. I want to grab the baton, but what do I do with it? Well, I'm suggesting that we take it right back to where it started. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That's how it started. So carry on the mission of God. Grab the baton and keep going. Share your bread with the hungry. Share your resources with the poor. That's how it started. So carry on the mission of God. Grab the baton and keep going. Proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Let your light shine. Let your light shine and pierce the darkness with the light of Christ. Let the hope that is within you spread like wildfire to those around you because that is how it started and that is how it's going. People of God, carry on his mission. Grab the baton and keep going. And don't be afraid when that darkness starts to push back. Don't be afraid, for he is with you, and you are full of the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't be discouraged. Don't allow yourselves to grow weary. Don't be afraid to stop and rest and eat. Be still in the presence of the Lord. Let him fill you with his Holy Spirit and bring you refreshing. Let him fill you with his word and bring you nourishment so that you can keep carrying on that mission of God. Grab the baton, get up, and keep going. Keep going. The story of Paul's final goodbye is a reminder of what really matters for us in the church. How beautiful it is to serve together and to love together in unity. Grace Church, we can do this. By the power of the Holy Spirit within us, and within the safety of the loving arms of our Father, we are equipped to carry on the mission of God together. So grab the baton. Grab the baton and keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Lord, teach us to listen for your Holy Spirit together. Teach us to encourage each other with the word of God. Teach us to let that word dwell within us richly. Lord, let it be like a wellspring coming forth from within us and out our mouths that we might be encouragement and even nourishment to one another. God, would you convict us if we're trying to go it alone? Would you place us in families, Lord? Make your church one so that the light can shine so brightly that the darkness wouldn't stand a chance. Help us not to be afraid, Lord God, when the darkness pushes back, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Lord, would you strengthen and encourage us today? Help us, God, each one of us, to grab the baton and keep going and to carry on your mission. Lord, bring people along our paths for us to serve, for us to love, even for us to forgive, that we could keep the mission going. That's how it started. And that's how it's going. Your church is alive. Your church is alive. Alive in Christ. Alive by the power of your Holy Spirit dwelling within us. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. Let everybody say amen. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.